You know, one of the things that I think that brings us to an event like the NMC is our desire, perhaps even our passion, to transform learning. When you think about taking on a transformation of that scale, it quickly becomes something that seems very tangled and twisted. What I would like to do in the next few minutes is to reach into that tangle and pull out a couple of threads, one a concept, the other a methodology, that I think can help us in our ambition to transform learning. First, a bit of context. The graph you see describes the fate of research in motion and the maker of the BlackBerry, and this is no news to anyone in the audience, I'm sure. But what I think it illustrates is how rapidly change can happen these days. Research in motion was very established, and in about a year it went from 15% profitability to a negative 3%, all indicating that transformation is a serious business, and if you don't take it seriously, the rug could be pulled out from under you. Not just research in motion, this is a recent article in the New York Times describing how Hewlett Packard and other established companies are having a difficult time reinventing and transforming themselves to keep pace with things. They describe HP as a star of the previous era, which I thought was a very, very telling, a very, very interesting way of describing them, that there was already, we can think about it being in a previous era and them trying to catch up. And all of us, a lot of us being in higher education, we see perhaps on a daily basis these articles and blog posts about how disintermediation has landed in higher education, higher education has to transform itself. And even if you don't grant those much credence, I think it's clear that we do need to take this notion of transforming ourselves very seriously because there are very powerful forces at work. So this brings me to the concept the concept of a wicked problem. Now this is actually a term that has some definition to it. It's not just a made up term. There's actually an article on it in Wikipedia that you could look up. So let's just go through it and see what a wicked problem is because it's not just like when your shoelace breaks or you can't find your iPhone. A wicked problem really has some dimensions to it that make it unique. If you're grappling with something and it feels like the scope and the complexity are unlike anything you really deal with, particularly on a day-to-day -day or even month-to-month -month basis, that it might be that the thing you're grappling with is a wicked problem. Using a medical analogy, perhaps, if you have a flu or a cold, you can link it back to a virus. There's a very linear causality that you can trace back and say, yes, the cause is very straightforward. This virus caused this particular disease. However, medicine also no has this notion of what they call a syndrome, which can't be traced back to a single cause, but to a complex or network of causes that makes the treatment very, very challenging and the diagnosis also very, very challenging. So if you're dealing with something and there's no clear cause, it feels very amorphous and ambiguous, it might be that what you're dealing with is something on the nature of a wicked problem. Not just business as usual. The usual things that you do to conquer challenges and opportunities as they arise simply won't do. You, when you need a new refrigerator, you write a check. If you need a new car, you write a check. If you need a new learning management system, you have processes and procedures in place that allow you to move from the previous system to the next system. But if you're grappling with something and say the normal way that we do things is not going to work, then again, that might be the telltale trace of a wicked problem. If you're looking at this and you're scratching your head and saying, hmm, what we need is something new, but if you're also finding yourself saying what we need is something really new, then it might be a wicked problem is what you're wrestling with. There's this also very interesting sort of iterative aspect to wrestling with a wicked problem is that as you move into the problem space and begin to grapple and search for a solution, your, under cha your understanding changes. And it can change to the point where you need to go back to the beginning and start the process all over again. So there's a kind of iterative aspect of dealing with a wicked problem that is very characteristic of a problem of this magnitude. Now, it's become fashionable to call almost any innovation, like repairing your shoelace, a disruptive innovation. But a lot of those have drifted away, I think, from the way that Clayton Christensen meant in his book, Innovator's Dilemma, back in 1997. And I think if I read him correctly, one of the trademarks of a truly disruptive innovation is that it shuts down whole ecosystems and sets into gear new ecosystems. The classic example he gave in his book 
was of workstation manufacturer and hard drives. If, you, if this is 1980 and you're DEC and you're producing workstations, you want to make those workstations ever more faster, bigger, braver, and stronger. So if I come to you and say, hey, look, I have a hard drive that is slower and has less capacity. You interested? You tell me to go get a life because you want to move. You want to have a sustained innovation. You want to increase the capacity, not to step backwards. But if this same drive is so small, it can go into a portable device or a mobile device. You've created the laptop and the whole range of mobile devices. And you begin to shut down the, the desktop computer in favor of these mobile devices. So a wicked problem generally calls for innovations of that scale, ones that begin to shut down whole ecosystems and set up new ones. And this is the part of the wicked problem that I like. It's recursive in the sense that even defining necessarily coming up with the definition of a wicked problem is itself a wicked problem. What is interesting about problems is they're like coins. You can't have a coin that doesn't have two sides to it. There's always an obverse and a reverse side of your coin. In the same manner, wherever there's a problem, there's an opportunity. And wherever there's a wicked problem, there is also a wicked opportunity. So that brings us to the methodology, which is this methodology called design thinking. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, heard about it, perhaps are even practicing it now where you work. And I think it is a methodology that is particularly suited to tackling these large-scale problems that we're facing. So let me now just describe some of the aspects or characteristics of it. Obviously, we don't have time to describe it in great detail. The key things to think about when you're in design thinking is, one, it is aspiring to bring design, the design process to all aspects of developing a product, developing a service, or affecting a transformation. It also doesn't move linearly from A to B, and it also seeks to not be circular in the sense of being static and stuck and simply repeating itself. It combines those two directions to produce a spiral-like way forward where you're circling but also moving forward at the same time. So the spiral staircase is a way of thinking about design thinking, a way of circularly moving forward. Now some of the steps in the design process when you employ design thinking, one, it really is suited to a wicked problem when you don't know what the solution is and you're seeking, you're going out on discovery and exploration. It likes to deal with small, diverse teams, small for agility, diversity, so you bring together a variety of expertise and a rich array of expertise so you can seek out all the possible solutions. It begins with observation. Instead of you thinking what you know your customers need, it relies on you going out into the field and looking at your potential customers and saying, what do they need? And the most skillful part of that invention is when you can discover latent needs and not just explicit needs. It then goes on with divergent exploration. So instead of trying to, at the beginning of the process, build consensus, it tries to build divergence. Again, to fan out as widely as possible, seeking for solutions on a scale that will scale up to the nature of the problem you're dealing with. And this is a Tim Brown phrase that I really like, build to think. It really wants you to get hands-on using Legos, pipe cleaners, whatever it might be, to really begin to develop quick prototypes so that your thinking is propelled along by actually making something. It then goes on to selecting from this array of possibilities what the true candidates are and then going on to implementation. So now I'm just going to talk about four key characteristics of design thinking in a little more detail. This notion I mentioned that it begins with, uh, it begins with divergence. Again, you think about normal processes that say let's all converge around the idea of making an X bringing in a new learning management system, making these tools available, and then carrying it forward. Because of the ambiguous and complex nature of the wicked problem, however, that's not suitable for trying to conquer that problem. So this whole process of design thinking begins with divergence. That is, you're trying to generate as many ideas as you, as you can, put them on the table so that these options emerge, and then after that you come back to a converging point where you begin to prune these away and the real candidates begin to surface. So this notion of divergence and convergence is really inherent to and important to the design thinking process. It tries to distribute design across the entire process of developing, whether it be, again, a product, a service, or a transformation. Now, in the older model, the 1.0 model, back in the days of perhaps the Mad Men, this is the way things kind of went forward. Engineering came up with perhaps a new vacuum cleaner, was then sent off to the design department to put something pretty over the top of it. 
then shipped off to marketing so they could make it appealing to the consumer who was supposed to buy it. So that process had, was a curious mixture of authority and passivity. The new process, or this process of design thinking, is really kind of a 2.0 process. So instead of a linear steps to progression where the thing is handed off from one set segment to another, it really brings all, those, all that expertise together to form a team that iterates with the potential user on an active, continuous basis in order to continually refine the ideas. And so there's more participation and more collaboration in the process than perhaps with more traditional methods. And as I've been saying, it's iterative and not linear. And linearity, if you think about it, really is at the basis of a lot of our assumptions about how these processes go forward. I just discovered this when I was preparing these, this, this particular slide deck. If you go on PowerPoint and, and select for the, uh, the smart art widgets that are there, they categorize them into categories, and one is process, and you pull it down, this is what you get. Look at what are on these images. It's all linear. It's all arrows, either going left, right, or top and down. And this reflects our natural way we think about these processes. Very linear, we've got to get from A to B. But the thing about the wicked problem is that the A is unclear and the B is unknown. So how are you going to have a linear process? So what design thinking tries to do is it has these three steps in their process. One they call inspiration, which is kind of just acknowledging that this problem is a big, hairy problem, a wicked problem perhaps, and we need a methodology that is equal to it. An ideation phase, which is the, that divergence phase I was talking about, and then an implementation phase in which you actually select a candidate and go forward with something. Now linearly you would think I was, we're going to progress from one to two to three in a very linear fashion, whereas design thinking acknowledges, yes, we want to go from inspiration to ideation and then over to implementation, but at any moment, because we're grappling and our understanding is changing, we might have to backtrack in order to again to move forward. And you might be all the way to the finish line and then have to go all the way back. But that's all part of the process. Finally, it's a playpen of constraints. If you think about what the playpen does for a kid, it's, yeah, this is a weird one. You say it's confining, but those walls open up that space inside and say, this is for play. It reserves that space for play. So that constraint is very important. And so what design thinking does in terms of the constraints it works in, it says, one, what we're doing has to be desirable to people. It has to fulfill some needs for them. It has to be feasibly technically to produce, and it has to be viable. There has to be a viable business model. And this is the playpen space in which design thinking can, can take place. So to kind of wrap things up, Design thinking is appropriate when you're tackling something big, like a transformation, like a wicked problem, because it's a kind of exploration. It's kind of a voyage of discovery. You don't know where you're headed as you, as you leave the gate or leave your starting point and move out. So it's really more akin to an exploration or this method of discovery. And again, I would just underscore the, my earlier suggestion is that you might think of a wicked problem is just too huge to deal with. But just keep in mind, I think we all need to keep in, in working together as a community to collectively discover these opportunities that come always with a problem. Now for further reading on design thinking, uh, the quick tour is a Harvard Business Review article that Tim Brown wrote, or you can grab the book that he wrote, which is about 250 pages. It's a good, good read, uh, and that will tell you all you really need to know about design thinking. And we can see instances of design thinking in action. This is an article that was written by Terry Anderson. It, it appeared just recently in Educational Researcher, um, in which you can see elements of design thinking being, being applied to the area of educational research. Um, also, IDEO, Tim Brown's organization, worked with some secondary schools to write this, which is um, kind of a guidebook or a handbook or a book of examples of a school applying their methods to education. So it gives some very, very concrete and some very, very valuable ideas, I think, about design thinking and things of that sort. And with that, I thank you very much for this opportunity.